You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, hey, Foundry Church. Uh, as you can see today, I, um, I'm living into what I promised. If you give me the shirt, by the way, I'm keeping this because I need a shirt to paint in. Um, but uh, if you, sorry, it's unfair. Um, but uh, somebody gave me a Detroit Lions shirt. Uh, my son said, oh, will you wear a Patriots shirt? To which I was like, dude, no, I'm not. But, but if you give me a shirt you want me to wear um, on, the, on the video teaching, I will gladly do so unless it's a Raiders, Patriots, and I'll just leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. I'm not angry at those teams. I just don't like them. I don't like them. And you know what, Kansas City Chiefs, too. I don't like them either. I don't like them. They've gotten good all of a sudden, and they're ruining my Denver Broncos. But anyway, this is not about that. But this is a Detroit Lions shirt, and because I'm wearing a Detroit Lions shirt, here's what I think about the teaching. It'll probably start well, fizzle halfway through, and do really bad at the end. That's just how it seems to go, right? (laughs) Let's just say this teaching won't get into the playoffs. Um, All right, enough jokes about that. Too far? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, As we dive in today, we're looking at our final kind of section in this series on Acts 2.42. The disciples devoted, the apostles devoted themselves, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the, the fellowship, this relational aspect, this community aspect, the breaking of bread and prayer. Last week we talked about prayer. This week we dial in on the breaking of bread and we dial in and look closely to what it means that Christ's body was broken for us. I think it's important that we wrestle with the idea of the diversity of the church. You know, there's this idea that the church is kind of this homogenous um, one note group of people. I will tell you this. I have been all around the world and um, not to everywhere, but everywhere I've been, the church didn't look like this. I have been in churches in Korea that would blow your mind. Unbelievable. Like they can seat 25,000 people in a room. And I've been in churches in Korea in a little fishing village where they can seat 25 to 30. And they pray just as fervently in each one of them. And they seek the lost. I've been in churches in Lebanon, in Cyprus, in England, across Europe. I've been in the beautiful Cathedral of Notre Dame during Mass. It's amazing. It's amazing to see the church so diverse, so widely different that there are churches meeting in mud huts and grand cathedrals. There are churches that are highly Pentecostal and churches that are very liturgical in their their, uh, proceedings. And both of them have a beautiful rhythm of worship within them. And the reality is we have to look back and say, okay, what makes all the churches kind of be one? What makes them one? What is the thing that makes the church one? And I would say that there's this communal aspect in church, this depth of relationships in church that make it very unique. But I think it actually, if we go back to its inception, the church's inception on the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed, he sat around a table and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. We gather communally because that's what the very first church did. Christ and the apostles gathered communally and they ate a sacred meal together that Jesus said was significant. Jesus said it was significant and Jesus served them. On the night he would be betrayed, The day before he would be on trial, he would be flogged, he would be crucified. He served them. He broke the bread for them and gave to them something to eat. I think that is super important that we understand that we, the church, are held together by the commonality of one thing, the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ, period. And it's why the early church devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Because they knew that this intrinsically communal thing, eating together, right? Eating together, it's such a communal thing. Think of it, on your first date, you usually go get something to eat. And you sit there and you go, I'll just have salad dry. I'm a really healthy eater. Three dates later, you're like sucking down a cheeseburger in three bites. But in the beginning, you go and you sit and have an awkward little meal. 
And in the church, we recognize that gathering at the table is an important part of the rhythm and the life of the church. It's why at the Foundry Church, we value the table. It's why whenever you're here, there's food out. You can come during the middle of the week. There's granola bars and little candy bars and things on the table. Kids, ask your parents first. But if you come in in the middle of the week, we have something on the table. There's a place for you at the table. Why? Because Jesus made a place. And when he broke the bread, he invited us to a communal existence centered on him and rooted in his broken body. I love that aspect of the church. But I want to talk for a minute because we who are Christians, or maybe we've been in the faith for quite a while, we understand the rhythm of communion. This is Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Take, eat, and drink. Think of it outside of the Christian context. Think of it outside of the church. If you're a brand new first-time visitor to church and they give you someone to eat and drink, you'd be like, well, this is the creepiest thing ever, right? You wouldn't understand. It wouldn't make sense. So let's just take a minute and look at how the disciples, the first church, would have received this. They're sitting at a meal that is rooted in the Passover, an ancient meal, 2,000 years old. And when they're sitting there, they're, they're having this time with Jesus that they expect to be in a certain order. It's been the tradition for over a millennia. And suddenly Jesus breaks in with these words, I have longed to eat this meal with you. I have longed to be here with you. And he takes the bread and when he holds it up, he says, this is my body and it's broken for you. And he gives each one of them some of the bread. And he says to them, as often as you eat of it, do so remembering me. So if you come here and you feel a little confused about communion, I want to invite you to share in the same air as the disciples. They would have been like, what? What? That doesn't make sense in our Hebrew mind. That doesn't make sense to us. This is the Passover meal. How can we eat your broken body? That doesn't make sense. And in the same manner also, he took the cup and he poured it and blessed it. And he said, this is the New Testament written in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The disciples' confusion would have been peaked and almost tremoring. Like, whoa, you can't just go change Passover. You can't go change Passover. That's like adding Avengers to, um, in the cultural context, Avengers to the Thanksgiving story in America. That doesn't fit. You can't do that, right? Theologically, and God-based belief would say, they would have been like, you can't do that. This is our most sacred meal. And Jesus says, no, no, I'm your most sacred meal. If you want to live, you have to take me in. You have to take me in. So today, it's going to be a little different in worship. I'm going to invite you to take a moment and share in communion. I know we normally do it at the beginning or the end, but today we're going to do it right in the heart of the message because we are people who gather around the broken body and shed blood of Christ. We are people who gather at Christ's body, broken for you, broken for me, for the remission of our sins. The breaking of bread in the early church was a spiritual and practical reality. It was a spiritual act where we participate with God in the mystery of communion. The broken body and shed blood of Christ remembered as we eat and take into us this this promise. In participation with God, we take into us the promise of his body broken, his blood shed, that we would no longer be held to account for our sin because he paid for them and our lives would be made new. The breaking of bread in the early church was a spiritual and practical reality. In that, I mean this. The apostles and the early church had gone from zero to like 4,000 people like that. And they were meeting everywhere. And remember, they were giving their land and their property, and they were giving to those who had need. 
and caring for the greater community, which means there was food distributions and things like this. In Acts chapter 6, we find the apostles in this situation. In those days, the number of disciples was increasing. The Hellenistic Jews among them, so the Hellenistic, Hellenized means uh, people who were Greeked. They were made into Greek citizens. Okay, so it's like being Americanized. Um, it, 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 they, were, they were Greeks by culture. It just, that's what the term Hellenistic means. They complained against the Hebrew Jews because the Hellenistic, the Greek widows, weren't getting the same food that the Hebrew widows were, and so they felt they were overlooked. And the apostles are now in the middle of this argument because people are like, why didn't you take care of my grandma, right? Just because she's Greek? And the apostles were like, whoa, wait a minute. What happened to the purity of the gospel? We are teaching and leading the church. Our job is not to make sure they get food. So they appoint people to serve the food. They appoint people to be the ones who do the work of serving the food so that, the, as the disciples said, they would not want to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables, which I think God kind of checks into the glass a little in this scripture because the apostles are called to the ministry of the word. But they also see a living example of what a ministry of serving tables does because they appoint to this a young man named Stephen, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And they also appoint Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas. Par Parmenas. And Nicholas from Antioch, a convert, a convert from Judaism, they presented these men to the church, they laid hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went out serving the church. They went about serving the church. And the word of God and the number of disciples increased rapidly as these men began serving while the disciples attended to the teaching and leading of the church. And a large, I love this line, a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. They became Christians. They started following Christ in mission. Now, here's, here's where I find myself in this tension of the reality of the breaking of bread. They are making sure people have food. But then they're not just serving tables. Listen to this. Now Stephen, a man full of grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they couldn't stand up against the wisdom of the Spirit as he spoke. I love that. He was a waiter, and these educated Hebrews would come and try to argue with him, and he would devastate him. So they stirred up opposition against him, and eventually they accused him or had someone bear false witness, which if you read the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness. They had someone create a false accusation against Stephen that he had blasphemed, and he was put on trial. And I love the reality that we see in this, that Stephen, who was a waiter to the tables of the, the widows and the needy of the community, was an ardent defender of the faith. His gift of hospitality didn't negate his call to be a student of the Word of God. He was a theologian in his own right. He knew the Word of God, and, well, they didn't like him. They pushed back against him. They actually found a way to entrap him because not only was he good at his service, the practical handing out of bread, but he also understood the deeper spiritual meaning of the breaking of the bread, the broken body of Christ for the masses. He was giving to them practical food, but he was also feeding their souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they put him on trial. And it says this in verse 15 of chapter 6. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I love that. I don't, I, I don't know. It's like, I don't know if he was especially handsome. 
you know, or what, or if it, there was a glow to him. I don't know. I just know that they looked at him, and it was like they were looking at an angel. It was like the Spirit of God was radiating out of him, and it transformed his being. His practical work made him glow with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The table, the table of God is what we're all called to. We are all called in specific ways to the giving of our time, our treasure, and our talents. Our very best, as Oswald Chambers would say, my utmost for his highest. And when we look at that, we recognize that the breaking of bread had a practical component, but that practical component was to feed the true need of people, the redemption, the thing they couldn't find anywhere else was salvation. And Stephen attended to that. And the members of the Sanhedrin glared at him. They couldn't stand him. So here's what I want to say about the table when we talk about it here. You are called to be part of the table. Our goal in being at the table is to make sure, yes, you have something practical when you come here. We, we do really good coffee here at Maine. There's, a, you know, I know out at Ben's, you guys do great lunches sometimes afterwards. There's, there's different things. Rooster has breakfast every week. See, Monday has a meal before. Tuesdays at the table has a meal before, right? We always have the table on display here. We believe a physical need we're speaking to meets, the, the physical need is met, but the spiritual need is engaged. And our hope is that all of us eventually go from the entry tables to the primary table where the body of Christ and the blood of Christ are on display and we meet him on his terms. At our need for salvation, his broken body and shed blood meets us. Our goal is to be there, but not just be there and receive, to be there and be empowered for service. You are gifted to serve and in doing so, in serving, you teach the gospel. In serving, with your time, your treasure, and your talent. I know how valuable your time is. I know how valuable my time is. But service is not below you. Service is the highest calling of the church. The church's very first martyr, the first blood shed out of the church after the death of Christ was Stephen. And I want to read that story to you. I want you to see this story with me and recognize that when we come to the table and we see the broken body of Christ, we desire to somehow emulate him. We want to follow in his footsteps. We become his disciples. And we serve in a way that can be very costly. And when we look at the life of Stephen, we can recognize the grace of God on him as he served, as he lived into his giftedness. Stephen's role in my opinion, was very similar to Jesus. Remember I said the night Jesus was betrayed, he served them. The day Stephen was handed over on false charges and put on trial, what was he doing? He was serving the broken bread for the widows, the orphans, and those in need, not knowing that his life would indeed become like Christ's, broken on behalf of the church, given in sacrifice to his Lord. Let's read Acts chapter 7, verse 48 through 60. Stephen is now on trial at this time, and he is given an amazing walkthrough of the the patriarchal faith, the Old Testament. He's walked them through, and he's just talked about um, the house of God, the temple of God, this high holy place in the mind of the Jewish people. And he says this, however, the Most High does not live in a house made by human hands. As the prophet said, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or well, where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all of these things? You stiff-necked people, your ears and hearts are yet uncircumcised. You haven't changed and made a covenant with me in your hearts. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, speaking of Jesus. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through the angels, but you have not obeyed it. Oh, oh man. This is, how it, this is how they responded. The members of the Sanhedrin, when they heard this, 
They gnashed their teeth and were enraged. They were furious. They fumed. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, hear that, church. The only way our lives ever become broken bread and poured out wine is simply by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is what that tells me. That when we are in our most dire moment, if we are spirit-filled Christians, we begin to see our lives as broken bread. We begin to see our lives beyond our circumstances. Remember last week, God's faithfulness is not bound to your circumstances. We begin to see God amid terrible circumstances. Stephen is about to be put to death, and what does he see? He sees God. He sees God and God only. Look, he cries, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, the Sanhedrin covered their ears and began yelling at the top of their lungs so that they didn't have to hear him. They didn't want to hear what, they had, what he had to say. They bum-rushed him. They ran at him. They took him. They drug him out of the city and began to stone him to death with heavy rocks. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who one day would become Paul, the apostle. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees and cried these words out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. That's the church. Like, that's, Stephen became the broken bread. His body was broken for Jesus. And he cried out very similar words. I mean, the words of Jesus are, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. The first martyr of the church cried out, Father, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He's interceding on behalf of people who are taking his life. He sounds like Jesus. He sees only Jesus. He becomes the broken bread and poured out wine. Why do you think the church devoted itself to the breaking of bread? It's not because they were hungry. It's because they found the one thing that satisfied the ache and purposeless, purposelessness of religion. They found Jesus. And in Jesus, they found life. And in life in Christ, they found everything in abundance. Everything in Christ is in abundance. He gives to us the abundance of life in him. It may cost us this life on this earth, but I will tell you this. There's nothing this earth holds that is worth worth missing the opportunity to be a broken piece of bread for Christ, to be part of the great story of our lives being broken bread. May it never be said of you and I, Never, ever, ever be said of you and I that our lives were spent in selfish gain and pursuit. Our lives are called to serve practically for the spiritual goal that everyone will meet Jesus, that everyone will see Jesus. The calling to you, the calling to me is all the same. Will you be broken bread and poured out wine on behalf of a world who desperately needs to know Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a religious symbol. You don't have to be a perfect person. Stephen wasn't perfect, but he was faithful. He was faithful. And that is the call to you. Your time, your treasure, your talent must all be laid down and devoted to the word of God, to the gathering community of God, the fellowship to the breaking of bread that your life may be, the broken bread, the living embodiment of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And then a life of prayer, praying for those who need Jesus. I I just think of it. Stephen's life, think of the rhythm of that. His life was devoted to Scripture, and he came to know Christ. And And he devoted his life to Scripture. And then what did he do? He was called to serve people food. And so he served and he taught. He taught and he served. He broke bread and served. And then what did he do? The very last thing. 
He prayed, Lord, don't hold this sin against him. The one thing we at the church can't be is people who are too good to serve at great personal cost to ourselves. You may be too busy to serve in the church, but that excuse holds no weight in the gospel. Your life, all of it, is called into gospel action. Gospel action. So I'm gonna invite you to devote yourself, to be a life devoted to being a person in the word of God, alive in the community of God with your time, treasure, and talent. Be in the fellowship, the family, the relationships, the community of God. Be a person who is devoted to being a life of broken bread. Give of yourself freely so that people can see how much Christ loves them. They will see him through us. And then in all circumstances, whether good or bad, pray, pray, church, pray, that God in some miraculous way can use your life, my life, to reveal his grace and goodness to the world around them. We get to be the broken bread. It's not an easy road, but it is the most blessed, wonderful road the church could ever walk. It's the road that have the distinct footprints of Christ on it. We follow in his, as his disciples. Where the rabbi goes, the church follows. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would give us the courage to be broken bread. Guard our hearts and minds as we are afraid at times of what could happen if we truly follow you. Would you give us a glimpse of what we should fear, what could happen if we didn't follow? Would you give us a glimpse of our life apart from you so that life in you becomes so much the richer? And we quit clamoring for the things of this world and we start longing for the things that break your heart to live into your gospel so that the lost and the hurting meet you, not through our perfect lives, but through lives that are broken, just like that of Stephen. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us at the table. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.